is Yelena and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about efficient machine learning for mobile devices. So let's start with uh, saying why do we need efficient machine learning. Uh, basically machine learning has transformed uh, many fields in which it was applied to but uh, we still have a challenge to bring it to embedded and mobile world. And uh, one reason to do so is to enable further developments in robotics. So when I say robotics, um, you might say, well, we already have some robots, right? They, they lift things from left to right, they, they do some dummy floor cleaning. But this is not what we want. We want to go a step further in, and we want to make them more intelligent, more empathetic, uh, able to understand humans, talk to them, uh, understand emotions and so on. Next domain in which we need efficient machine learning is autonomous driving. I think I don't have to motivate this one because pretty much uh, many investments are now exactly in this domain and a lot of things are happening here. Uh, furthermore, we, we need it for healthcare. So uh, basically now almost everyone has a smartphone that is collecting a lot of information about people and this, uh, this information, this smartphone sensors can be used to further improve uh, medical conditions of people who use it. Uh, later we need it for biometrics, so with uh, our mobile devices we can do already something like uh, uh, face recognition, uh, fingerprint detection and so on and so on. So it's something we need. But then we need it for personal assistance. Um, we already actually use it quite a lot for personal assistance. Uh, we also need it for defense. This is a bit of controversial topic. Uh, it's about I for autonomous weapons. Some people uh, agree, some people disagree. I'm not entering th uh, that domain, I'm just saying that if we want it, we need efficient machine learning there. Finally, uh, last but not the least, we need it for security. So the more uh, mobile devices we have, the more connected they are. Uh, they store more sensitive and confidential data about our lives and we want, to be, uh, what we want them to be protected, we want them to be secure. Since this is also something that I'm working on, I'm, in, I'm going to discuss mostly about security, about secure machine learning, and um, this is basically part of my work. My work, uh, as I said, is uh, one part of my work is this machine learning for security, and uh, within this domain I'm dealing with uh, malware detection, also intrusion detection, anomaly detection, failure prediction, but also I did some work on uh, face recognition that can be used for biometrics and so on. One another uh, big component of what I do is actually security for machine learning and uh, machine learning being it deployed in security domain or not, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is that uh, there are attacks that can be performed on these machine learning systems when deployed in practice and these attacks is something that I'm looking at and trying to understand. At the same time, I also work on defenses against these kinds of attacks and uh, I'm also interested in uh, how we can further improve trust that we place in machine learning when deployed in practice, uh, mostly through explainable methods. Uh, so both of these domains are interesting, but what, what becomes very interesting is that we on, when we, on top of this, add specifics of application domains, especially if domains are constrained, like for example mobile systems and embedded systems and that is exactly what I'm dealing with, combination of all of this. In the rest of this talk I'm going to focus mostly on malware detection for mobile systems and uh, discuss this component, uh, but as you see there is uh, in general a lot of work to do and as if this wasn't enough of work to do I'm also searching for a new job so um, uh, if, you, if you know some uh, potentially suitable position and so on, something that would fit, feel free to let me know. So, coming back to machine learning and uh, efficiency and so on, uh, I, I would like to discuss my recent work that was about how to make, uh, that was discussing uh, how to make um, malware detection suitable to be used on the device. 
And uh, this work is actually in collaboration with my previous PhD advisor, Professor Malek, and uh, my colleague um, Alberto Ferrante. And we did this work back in Switzerland where I was doing my PhD. So, uh, why mobile malware? Why, why do we bother to detect it? Well, since a uh, couple of years already, a uh, number of uh, mobile users is actually higher than a uh, number of desktop users. So, there, the estimation is that there are around 2.5 billion uh, mobile devices in the market. But this, um, this number changes all the time and so on. The thing is that there are many phones around there. Uh, what is interesting with them is that they contain sensitive and private information and many people got interested to exploit this environment. And actually uh, it is now since years that uh, mobile malware is a number one threat in the security domain. So here uh, I'm just showing uh, how it doesn't matter actually what the numbers are. Interesting thing is that the number of mobile malware samples is on the rise. And this is the case since years already. And uh, now, okay, we have around 20 million samples, is again estimation, but uh, the thing is that there is a lot of mobile malware there. Uh, what is interesting with uh, mobile malware is that we still want it to be accurate. So, same as for PC malware, we want to have a high detection performance, we would like to have a low false positive rate, and so on and so on. But the thing is that these things are usually achieved with detection methods of higher complexity. And what we are dealing here is the environment that is constrained. The environment we have here is constrained, sometimes in terms of battery, sometimes in terms of memory, sometimes in terms of CPU, sometimes it's a combination of multiple constraints, but it is a particular environment. So uh, the main steps of the machine learning systems when deployed in, uh, in uh, mobile devices and in general, let's say, uh, are first training uh, in which we have a data set that represents our domain. Then we choose features that are uh, the most representative about the, the phenomena we are looking at. And then we choose a set of uh, algorithms that could potentially separate this data and then based on some metric we say well I want this one, this one performs the best for me. Then we go into deployment, we use the, the method we selected and we hope for the best, right? We hope it will be good, it will perform well and so on and so on. So once we have uh, such deployed the detection system um, a set of challenges arises and uh, here I'm discussing a detection system that we propose as a part of our previous work but uh, the detection system itself is a bit more complex but here I'm presenting its simplified version just to make a point that comes later and uh, with this system what we do is that we again look at, into the indicative features we say okay there is uh, some machine learning based module that is trying to detect malicious application and this module uh, operates based on a set of parameters. Uh, these parameters are, uh, they are different and mostly they are related to how long we should observe the application, uh, how many malicious uh, instances appeared within the window that we looked at, how many times this has happened and so on. These are different parameters and um, if based on them we decide that uh, something malicious is happening, we are triggering an alarm. We say there is a potential malware and so on. So, uh, interesting, one interesting point uh, is that uh, steps uh, towards effic efficient solutions are definitely feature selection that allows us to, on one side, decrease number of parameters that we monitor in the system and thus power consumption. Uh, but on the other side, uh, sometimes it even allows for better performance because we are saying to the system, look only into the most important aspects, not the ones that might actually confuse the system. The other aspect is uh, choosing algorithms of low complexity that are suitable for embedded environment. But the third aspect that is not so frequently taken into account is uh, choosing suitable sampling period. 
And this is something that we explored a bit in our work and we found very interesting results with the tuning sampling period for malware detection purposes. So here in this graph I'm depicting uh, what is the dependency between different sampling periods between 2 and 16 and uh, between uh, pa uh, consumed power. So consumed power is something that we want to be as low as possible in the embedded world. And here we see also, which is intuitively also clear, is that the higher the sampling period becomes, the lower the consumed power is. Uh, what is sampling period is basically just um, a number that is telling us how frequently we are looking into the state of a device. So for example, if a sampling period is two seconds, this means every two seconds we observe system parameters, something like a memory usage or CPU or network traffic, and then we say, okay, I think it is malicious, I think it is not, and so on. It's, a, it's a how frequently we do this. Uh, what is interesting to see is that with uh, different sampling periods, uh, so here I'm depicting sampling periods with respect to app measure. Um, maybe not everyone knows what F measure is. It is basically a harmonic mean between precision and recall. So it is one number that tells us how good the detection performance is. So the higher this number is, the better the detection performance is. Um, what is interesting to see here is that, yes, for some um, sampling periods, for example, for two seconds, we can have different uh, F measure depending on the detection parameters that I previously mentioned, something like window size, thresholds, number of checks, and so on. Uh, but it is also interesting to see that for different sampling periods and different parameters, we can still maintain high uh, F measure. And this is something that we want, right? We want to have low power and as high F measure as possible. And uh, for example, for the last two sampling periods of 12 and 16, we have something like this. So we have a potential domain, potential area that is interesting for us, that lies somewhere between a uh, high sampling rate and the uh, high F measure. And this is something that we will take into account into design of uh, our detection system. So uh, how do we uh, design this detection system is that we uh, take into account uh, detection performance. It is clear why we need it, the, the detection system still has to be good. Uh, power consumption, because it's an uh, embedded device, mobile device, uh, power consumption matters. But at the same time we look at, into a time. By time I mean uh, detection time. Uh, time that passes since application starts running on the phone until the system is able to say uh, something malicious is happening here. So here we have this uh, detection system that I previously discussed and so on and so on. Uh, what we do is that we do, we do evaluate, uh, what we evaluate the detection results based on specific set of detection parameters and uh, then, based on this, we look into detection accuracy, detection time, and power as something that is of our interest. And then we have something that is called um, metric of choice. Uh, this metric of choice is uh, something that allows us to tune the detection system with respect to the requirements of a specific domain. So, what we have here is that in some uh, detection domains, <coughs> detection accuracy might be absolutely needed, no matter what. And uh, in that case, we, we say set a metric that is mostly focusing on detection accuracy. Some detection domains are actually very constrained, and in those domains we would say, well, I have this much power, and I want a solution that is as best as possible within this power. And in that case, we choose a metric that resembles these requirements. In some cases, uh, each of them might be equally important, so there is a metric that represents this. 
Once we have this metric, we go back and uh, we set the, the system parameters in a way that is resembling the metric of choice. So we set sampling period that is uh, good for the metric and we set those detection, detection parameters that allows, allow us to get the customized uh, malware detection solution. So uh, in order to test how well this system works, we basically performed a set of experiments on around 2,000 uh, malicious applications and uh, benign applications on the Android device and this, uh, this database is now publicly available as uh, dynamism on Zenodo, uh, Zenodo so if you are interested in this, if you want to play a bit with uh, dynamic malware detection systems you are welcome to download it and see how it works for you so, um, Coming back to this, after we run each application in Android emulation, what we do is that we use uh, something that is called monkey, monkey Runner. It's not a real animal, it's just uh, an application that, uh, that is doing a lot of uh, clicks on the device and tries to uh, trigger as many as possible execution paths of malicious programs and benign programs that we look at. After this, we do record and store uh, application behavior. So we, for each of the applications we look at, we store what are, uh, how, what are the patterns, uh, how does it behave with respect to memory and CPU consumption. And uh, based on this, we do monitoring of system parameters in intervals that I mentioned before. So this is our data set. And uh, once we do the experiments uh, with this, we get something like this. So in this figure, I basically give an example of how the methodology I discussed before can be used. And this example is uh, taking into account, you remember our metric of choice? Well, here we took the one that is taking into account is equally important, F measure, power, and detection time. And uh, with respect to this metric, we now try to see uh, which solution, which set of detection parameters fits the best for our, for our system. And what we get is, we see that, okay, the metric that, that the, the, the system parameters that maximize this metric are somewhere here. So these are basically the maximums. And there what we get is something like, um, F measure around 0.85, detection time of 85 seconds, uh, relatively low power, uh, some false positives, and 92% uh, detection rate. So the, uh, the thing that matters here is that um, there is a trade-off. And uh, there is a trade-off means that if we only look into the accuracy, which is a common way to do this, which most people do like this, we get something like this. We get some F measure that is higher, we get very long detection time, some, let's say, as, uh, lower false positives, uh, detection rate of some kind, and then some power. Uh, what is important here is not exactly the numbers in this and that kind. What is important is that we have a solution that allows us to choose a system that fits the best our requirements. And the system that fits the best our requirements should, in most cases, is never just accuracy. It, in most cases, there is more than this. And uh, doing a, doing a design of a malware detection system in this way, we can, uh, we can already enter this information from the very beginning and get solutions that are in line with what we exactly need. So, um, there are also other ways to achieve efficiency, it's not just us that managed to do it somehow. And uh, these other ways are of course going into hardware acceleration of, uh, of uh, systems. Uh, other way, uh, other option is of course to do further software acceleration of methods. Uh, one possibility is also to do algorithmic optimizations. And here we, we have things uh, like pruning, when you basically just set a lot of weights to zero. If weights are very small, you just set them to zero. Or we can do quantization, where we decrease precision of weights and so on. We can do maybe uh, network distillation, so these are all algorithmic things. 
there are also ways, of course, to combine both software and hardware approaches. And one another way is that we can use domain-specific data. Because sometimes if we have very good domain-specific data, this data being very accurate and so on about the phenomena allows us to have efficient detection solution trained on it. So, uh, at the same time, there are many different open problems for machine learning for mobile devices and one of these problems is lack of data. Uh, lack of data is a problem because while we have a lot of publicly available data sets, uh, how mobile devices operate is particular to the specific use case, uh, particular to a specific set of sensors that this mobile device run, maybe some particular noise in this environment and so on and so on. So it's not really easy to use everything um, interchangeably. Um, one way that this problem can be overcome is through transfer learning, so that from some another similar domain, maybe we take pre-trained models and try to make them better, but this does not necessarily always work. Um, one another open problem with uh, uh, efficient uh, machine learning is that uh, this is, I would say, also similar to machine learning in general. There are many different hyperparameters to tune. And tuning all of these parameters is frequently use case specific, application domain specific and so on. So it is not really easy sometimes to do. And the best way uh, to cope with this is to do automated methods. Uh, to, make, to make the hyperparameter selection as automated as possible. Further problem is concept drift and uh, the systems we deploy in practice on mobile devices should be able to cope with uh, changes of data and uh, if they don't have mechanisms to do so, it can happen that the, their decisions or classification outcomes and so on just become irrelevant after some time. And it is something that uh, we should take into account. One way to cope with this is uh, online learning, it is basically constantly learning from the data. Uh, but that has maybe some other problems. It can be maybe some poisoning attack on the data that is uh, reused and so on. And uh, finally, there are also security problems. So, and security problems are, uh, in my opinion, very, very relevant problems because in the latest years we have seen the rise of uh, adversarial machine learning that is basically, uh, that has shown that there are different attacks that we can do on machine learning systems and th these attacks are sometimes even transferable from one to another system and so on. So, uh, just uh, as a takeaway, I would like to, to summarize and stress again that uh, improving accuracy of machine learning is absolutely needed, uh, but accuracy is not only metric that matters, and um, basically taking into account application-specific requirements is of uh, crucial importance here. Uh, the other aspect is that uh, efficiency of designed uh, solutions should be taken into account from the early, system, early stages of a system design. And in this way we can derive solutions that are suitable for domain of interest instead of just arriving towards the end and saying, oh, I have perfect system but it cannot actually run on a mobile device, so what do I do now? And uh, if possible, these systems should be automated so that we can uh, adopt them to different use cases <coughs> easily. Finally, there are many open problems and just uh, I just mentioned some lack of data, security and so on, concept drift. And uh, as you see, there, are, uh, there is a lot of further work needed in this domain and I hope that uh, my next position, next job, I'll be able to tackle some of this. So, uh, here I have uh, some publications that, that with time I crafted on these topics of malware detection, anomaly detection and so on and so on. And uh, here uh, I leave my email and uh, in case you have some comments, questions or something like this, I'm looking forward to hear them either now or via email or later, whatever works for you. Thank you. Thanks, Yorana. So we have time for questions. If you have any questions, please just ask. 
So maybe it's known to this audience, but I've never heard of hyperparameters. What, what are those? Okay, so uh, hyperparameters are actually different things that you can set in order to design machine learning of a specific kind. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, if you are designing a neural network, one thing that you can choose at the beginning is architecture of this neural network. You can say, I want one layer with this many neurons, I want ten layers, and so on. This is one hyperparameter. There are others. You can use uh, one or the other loss function. There are things like uh, epochs and so on. All these things that are tunable to the specifics of some data set are considered hyperparameters. Thank you. Thank you. During your, your studies, um, did you face challenges of trying to choose a desired algorithm and it wasn't possible or too, too exhausting for the mobile devices? Or, so, or which algorithms to concentrate then? So, yes, so um, there are, uh, it of course depends on the mobile device mm -hmm. also. Uh, I always try to choose as simple as possible detection algorithms because my goal was to go beyond the mobile. So, okay, Android is now very powerful. Most devices running Android can actually support even neural networks and so on and so on. Uh, but I really want to go as low power, let's say, as possible. So in my in my uh, applications, I mostly dealt with very simple uh, decision-based uh, things, uh, logistic regression-based things, uh, combination of logistic regressions, and so on. If you, for example, recall the, the detection uh, system I mentioned, it has a set of checks, like a set of parameters, and so on. But each of these is based on um, a logistic regression de detection on one instance. And then I would need to collect a lot in order to make a decision. But yes, I, I really wanted to go low power with this. And the, with this low power, I eventually arrived to something like uh, 20, 20 milliwatts of uh, average power consumption, let's say. While, for example, Facebook app has around 500 milliwatts. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I could probably uh, run more complex things, but the goal was of this kind. So. Okay. How long you should run your application to actually start <coughs> predicting that you have some malware on the telephone? Yes, so um, what we did since we had to experiment with limited uh, data, mm -hmm. uh, we uh, made an assumption that it is enough that we observe application behavior within first 10 minutes and uh, this is how our data was collected. So we had startings of each application, first 10 minutes, and then uh, you see that uh, later on I report something like a detection time of 80 seconds or 140 seconds and so on, that is the average detection time. So this is the average detection time, but this is of course related also to sampling rate. So uh, sampling rate creates a trade-off in terms of detection time, and with a higher sampling rate of 16 or so, it is clear that the detection time becomes longer. So yes. it is again a part of the metric, what you want to optimize for each environment and so on and so on. And then probably if detection time is your main goal, you would, as a result of your metric, arrive to very, very low sampling rate, very fast you would be checking what is going on, what is going on, and that would be somewhat more power consuming. Yes. Uh, but is there any flexibility to, to, to let it adjust to adapt to my own uh, environment, my own software? Will, I, will it uh, learn incrementally over time? So, uh, what you in this case, what you would have to do is that you would simply have to collect, you would have to uh, make it run for some time, just retrain it, and then place it again on your phone. Uh, but who will supervise that uh, training? I mean, once you set up the Yes, so the, in that case you would basically go through rerunning everything again. So you would have again a set of rep newly representative malicious samples, maybe from a, a Play Store or somewhere. So uh, 
a system of this kind you cannot train simply with your data because there is constantly a lot of malware that is emerging out there. So when you do retraining, you have to take into account this new malware. That you don't have to be attacked by each and every malware in order, in order to now be protected, no. You have to retrain the system with this newly represented in data and just run it again on your so phone. speaking of the business model, I can imagine that I have a subscription to a database just instead of getting uh, an update on the newest, most recent uh, viruses database, I would get uh, fresh embeddings or something like that. <laughs> well, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not proposing business things here, but yeah, maybe that's, that's a way to spin it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, does the system generalize to different um, types of devices, different types of phones? Or do you have to retrain them for every phone or every, um, every operating system? It's a very good question. Uh, the answer to this question is um, based on experiments, let's say. And we did uh, a set of experiments of this kind. And for our, our results show that it does uh, generalize. But uh, there are, of course, limitations also in, in this because if we checked for the same, ver the same uh, versions of Android, if you change a version of Android, uh, then most likely would have to be retrained because how a different version of Android interacts with dynamic features that we look at here uh, can be different. And once you have something different, Although it's normal, it can be actually misclassified. So the answer is yes, there <coughs> some uh, limitations, let's say. But uh, if you really want to say everything is uh, suitable to everything, then the answer is actually no. You have to retrain it for specifics, yeah. Okay. But it's a very good question. It's a very good point. Uh, you mentioned something about the transfer learning in yeah. the system. How you see this, how this is possible in this domain? Could you explain a little bit more about this? Yes. So, uh, transfer learning is actually something that is very, very suitable for security domain, or at least we want it to be suitable, mm -hmm. because there are limited instances of attacks that we, that we deal with here. And if you have, uh, for example, uh, some failures or anomalies and so on, it is, uh, it is in some domain, and you have a lot of them, it is very promising for us to say, oh, let me take that model, retrain maybe a set of last layers, and see if that model is able to detect my attacks much better than when I fully retrain it from scratch with my limited set of data. So, uh, uh, just to, to answer your question, what you would do, let's say I want to check if transfer learning works for me, I should go there, see which other methods exist of a similar kind, the more similar the better, and try to take them, take the train model, and start retraining some of the last uh, layers and see how does it work. Does it work well with the limited set of attacks I have, or it actually maybe doesn't, and so on. And that's, so that's always the trick with transfer learning. It might work worse <coughs> than your model, so. Oh, okay, so transfer Sorry. learning. <laughs> My next question is will be uh, how you will deal with the malware that was installed by the phone manufacturer, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> so, mm, it's a good question. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, I would have to think about it. I would have to think about it. It was it's from the start immediately, it's inside. Mm -hmm. Probably a system of this kind uh, would not be suitable <laughs> to, to uh, solve this problem. There should be some other system, something like a golden method, golden model, and then you compare maybe even on normal behavior with this golden model, and then you say, well, even when my, method is, when my uh, mobile is not attacked, it somehow performs differently, but this is not easy also because every system is uh, kind of all of the same kind, actually different. So, yeah. Sure. Thank you. Next question. No. <laughs>
I have a question. <coughs> Is there any spectacular feature you can point out how a malware uh, differs from a normal operation? So, <laughs> there are two actually. One is uh, spectacular, the other one is less spectacular, let's say, but interesting. Uh, one that is less spectacular is actually CPU consumption. So, we have seen that somehow malicious applications use less CPU uh, than uh, benign ones. So, this, this is one thing one can argue why exactly and so on. In, in the scenarios we looked at, this was the case. The other case is that there is something that is called uh, TTF fonts. It regulates, like, um, it is connected with the fonts that actually application uses to display text and so on. And what we have seen is that this is a very interesting feature to look at because most malicious applications don't have to deal so much with the uh, texts. So they, they didn't think about somehow including also this one just to seem more legitimate and so on. So yeah, I would, I would maybe just this to say that okay, they are somehow interesting. Thanks. Yeah, welcome. Okay, thanks for coming. <laughs>